What is the single most important thing to be innovative? In these days, all of a sudden, everybody wants to be innovative. Companies, employees, startups, institutes, cities. But this hasn't always been the case. So what happened that innovation has moved on top of the list of economy and society? Three things. Number one, shrinking product life cycles. In past times, when you innovated and launched a new product, it used to be a fair and realistic assumption to expect it to last. D depending on the branch for 10, 20, 30 or even more years time before it would face new competition and finally vanish. Today, product life cycles are radically shrinking. In some branches, only one year after launching a new product, it has turned into something old and ancient already. Just think about how often you change your phone and then go and ask your parents how often they used to do it to get a sense of what I mean. Shrinking product life cycles call for radically increased innovation speed. Number two, disruptive business models and new competitors. New competitors, in particular startups, pop up everywhere and threaten established companies. And what makes it so threatening to established companies is the fact that this new competition comes from outside the industry. The biggest competitors for companies like Mercedes, Volkswagen or BMW is not Mercedes, Volkswagen or BMW anymore. It is companies like Uber, Google, Tesla, or maybe some kid sitting somewhere in China working on a new mobility platform or technology. And the only way to avoid being disrupted by these new competitors is to be yourself ahead of the pack through constant radical innovation. Number three, digitization. Digitization has reached a whole new level leading to unprecedented possibilities to design and invent new products and services. It is the most important factor and perhaps the least understood one. Digitization is the driving force behind shrinking product life cycles and behind new competition from digital startups. Understanding the implications of digitization is the key to understand the paradigm shift in innovation. We will come back to it in a minute. So the question is how to innovate. There are many, many methods and tools out there giving an answer to that question. But at the end of the day, no matter how you call it, design thinking, design sprint, loop, agile innovation, they're all methods coming from one and the same innovation toolbox. And it is true that these tools are the right ones to drive innovation forward. But it is also true that tools alone have never led to any innovation. Tools are not innovative, human beings are innovative. What is built with a tool depends on the thinking and the mindset of those who use it. And the best design thinking process cannot invent what the imagination of those who go through it doesn't dare to think. So when looking for the single most important thing to be innovative, this is the place to look at. We need to look at the mental framework in which innovation is taking place. And we need to adapt this mental framework to the paradigm shift in innovation. So, what is this paradigm shift? Until the beginning of the 21st century, the decisive question for innovation was what innovation is technically possible? This question is becoming irrelevant. The decisive question for innovation today and tomorrow is what innovation is reasonable? Because today, everything is technically possible. 
Now let's look at that a little bit closer. And let's start with the second part of it first. Today, everything is technical po technically possible. Now that's a big claim, and you may wonder, where is the proof? And this brings us back to digitization. Of course, we are all aware that we're entering the era of digitization, but we have hardly understood and incorporated what it actually means. And the key thing to understand here is that the driving force behind digitization, the development of computer performance, is developing exponentially. Computer performance is developing along Moore's law, roughly saying that the numbers of transistors you can place on a chip, and by that, the performance of the computer, is doubling every one and a half to two years. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you have heard this before. You know this. The point I'm trying to make is, you may know it, but you don't understand it. And if you rationally do, you don't believe it because you can't imagine what it means. Let me try to explain it with an anecdote. The anecdote some of you may know, is the story of the invention of the chessboard. The story goes that the inventor of the chessboard brought his game as a gift to the King of India. The King of India looked at it, played it, loved it, and asked the guy what he wants as a reward. And he said, Dear King, all I want from you is one grain of rice and to place it on the first field of the chessboard and to double it with every further field. That's an exponential development, just like the doubling of transistors on a chip. The King of India thought about it, did what you might be doing right now. He started to calculate. One grain of rice on the first field of the chessboard. Double amount, two grains of rice on the second field. Double amount, four grains of rice on the third field, and so on and so on. And when you run this calculation, you find out that after the first row of the chessboard, after eight fields, you have 128 grains of rice. The King of India agreed. Exponential developments are very boring and slow at the beginning slowly building up bigger and bigger figures. But once they have reached a significant figure, they suddenly explode. How much grains of rice do we have after the second row of the chessboard, after eight more fields? Roughly 33,000. You're the king of India, that's peanuts. How much grains of rice do we have after the first half of the chessboard? After the first half of the chessboard, the moment is reached when the exponential development turns into a tsunami. We have built up several billion grains of rice, and when you double several billion grains of rice with every further field, you're reaching dimensions beyond imagination. At the end of the second half of the chessboard, after only four more fields, we have 18 quadrillion grains of rice. That is an 18 with 18 zeros. And when you place 18 quadrillion grains of rice next to each other, you can cover the whole planet Earth with rice. The end of the story is that the inventor of the chessboard got beheaded. Now, what does this story tell us if we take it as an analogy for us trying to cope with digitization in general, and for us trying to be innovative in the era of digitization in particular. The good news is, in this analogy, you are not the inventor of the chessboard. The bad news is, you are the king of India you may rationally understand what's going on, but you can't imagine it. And you can't imagine it because up to today, you, I, all of us, 
we have lived on the first half of the chessboard, in which the exponential development of computer performance was comparatively slow. We could watch it and kind of go along with it. But now we are entering the second half of the chessboard, in which every further doubling of computer intelligence is leading to dramatic performance increases that will open up almost limitless possibilities. We are running into a world which only a few years ago would have appeared to us as surreal science fiction. And we're running at exponential speed. Just think about your favorite science fiction movie. What do you see there? Flying cars? Already out there. We just don't call them flying cars, we call them taxi drones. Mind-controlled body extensions, like in Star Wars or Spider-Man, already out there. If that's not science fiction enough for you, how about mind reading? Reading what you are thinking right now. Companies like Facebook are working on it. Tech companies are working on abolishing death by scanning your brains and uploading them into virtual realities. How much more science fiction can it become than that? Today, everything is technically possible. And if not today, well then, on the next field of the chessboard or the next. That should be your working hypothesis when it comes to innovation in the era of digitization. Now, what are the consequences of this paradigm shift? This brings us back to the first part of it. What innovation is reasonable? I want to outline two major implications. There are many, but I want to outline one major implication at the business level and one major implication at the social level. At the business level, this shift calls for a completely new skill set when it comes to innovation and ideation. At the first, on the first half of the chessboard, what you needed to do was to filter out the technically feasible from the nonsense. In order to do that, what you needed was good technical know-how, which is why you packed your engineers and scientists together in R&D departments and outsourced the task to be innovative to these guys. On the second half of the chessboard, what you need to do is to filter out the reasonable from the nonsense. If every idea, no matter what, is one that is in principle technically possible, then you need to find the one that is big and worthy enough to spend your scarce resources on it. You need to find the reasonable within a vast ocean of technically feasible things. And in order to do that, technical know-how is not the crucial know-how anymore. You will certainly need good technical know-how when it comes to implementing your ideas. But when it comes to finding the right big worthy ideas, this is not actually what you need. What you need is the boldness to dare to think what on the first half of the chessboard would have appeared to you as mere craziness. And what you need is the management skill to make tough decisions of what to do and what not to do under the always changing conditions of a VUCA world. And last but not least, what you need is the leadership skill to convince others to follow your vision and decision. And this skill set is nothing you can outsource to an R&D department. It is at the core of what management is about. At the social level, 
the fact that we are running into a world in which almost everything is technically feasible calls for a check of reasonability on a different level. Playing around with ideas like mind reading or scanning and uploading brains used to be the job of science fiction writers. When all of a sudden it becomes the job of tech companies and engineers to turn fiction into reality, then we as a society need to wake up and start asking whether these are good ideas or not. Whether we want them to turn reality or not. When technical feasibility no longer limits and filters what idea is entering the world, then society and regulation need to fill the gap. And we're not yet prepared to do that. But we better get prepared fast because tech companies are not waiting for it. Thank you. <laughs>